Right, hello, welcome back to another video. Uh, today we're going to be having a look at something that a few people have asked me about, and that's the difference between uh, world position offsets uh, and displacement. So, um, <coughs> in this context, we can be looking at environments uh, and environment materials, uh, and both of them are ways we can add a bit of sort of extra depth to our materials. So, uh, I'm going to extend that a little bit, and we're also going to look at bump mapping and parallax, off parallax offset or parallax occlusion mapping. Sorry. Um, and how they can all kind of like create different levels of of extra depth to our uh, to our material. So have here just a um, normal flat material, um, just normal diffuse texture, um, normal map roughness, etc. Um, you might have noticed that flickering. So this is something that's going to happen a little bit occasionally uh, when we're dealing with uh, world position offsets. Um, We'll get it onto a second, but it's going to be moving the the verts. So um, there's a fix for it. Uh, we can change the the bounds of our of our mesh. Um, if you are interested in more, I have done a detail uh, a detail a video on this before. Um, but if you just go and change the bounds, if you ever see that kind of flickering, what's happening is the engine's not sure whether it should be on screen or not. So it's not sure whether to render it. So it kind of flickers on and off um, frame by frame, depending on whether. It what they think. So if you just up the scales and yeah, the bound scale, it's just going to artificially make those bounds bigger. Um, and that should fix that problem. So, right, back to our materials. So this is just a basic flat material. Um, and I've applied this world position offset to it. So if we have a look at our material. Here we are, yeah, diffuse texture, normal map. And I'm using three different maps packed together um, ambient occlusion, and then green is roughness, and uh, then a height map. Um, and you'll see, I'm just plugging it into the world position offset, um, plugging, multiplying it by an amount, so how how much of this effect, how much do we want things to be moved by, and then in this case, I'm just moving things up, we're looking at a ground plane, um, I'll go back to the level, um, so we're just moving things up in that axis, so if we have a look here, this is then using that, that world position offset shader, um, well, this one's using the same one, but you'll notice there's not much visible happening. So what's happening here? Well, if we look at this in wireframe, it's just a flat plane. If I go into the material, just split screen this slightly, if we scale this up, it is moving, and it is moving those sort of four corner verts, but the way world position offset works is it has, uh, it's under vertex shader, so it's, it's doing this by moving the vertices before they get rendered. So. Um, if I go here, this is a much more divided plane. If I look in the wireframe, you can see it's a, a 10 by 10. Um, and so now, when we're doing that that world position movement, um, you're getting kind of a bit more of a, a, a better result. Um, so for world position, uh, it's happening on the vertex shader, so you need vertices to be able to do that movement. Um, and it's quite a cheap operation. Uh, we've only got, if it's 10 by 10, that's 100 verts on this whole plane. If you compare that to the number of pixels being rendered on screen, it's it's orders of magnitude less. So if anything we can do on the on the world position offset um, is going to give us um, a nice cheap result for that kind of movement. And for small amounts, you can see it adds a little bit of detail. It's quite nice. Um, we're getting slightly more three-dimensional kind of things to that. Uh, select the right thing. Um, but it's still not great. I mean, if we up this quite a lot, you can still see we're getting hard edges. Maybe some more geometry would help with that. Um, and you're still going to get kind of triangulation across that, uh, where the where the so the triangulation of the of the planes of the quads is is there. So, um, as an alternative, we can do what's called dynamic tessellation, uh, and then we can use a displacement map. So, um, it's basically the exact same principle. If I open up the displacement thing. Um, two things we need to do. First, uh, down here in tessellation, we need to turn on tessellation. Um, there's two options, flat triangles and PN triangles. We're just going to be using flat triangles for now, um, but I do have the documentation up in a second. Here we are. So, what this tessellation is going to do is it's going to divide our plane, or each of our, our planes up, um, many times. Um, and that's going to give us extra kind of like verts only at runtime, and um, we're going to use those to move. So before we were only getting uh, a plane with no verts, wasn't giving us any good results at all. A plane with a few verts, sort of 100 verts, is going to give us a sort of a halfway house 
um, a little bit of movement. So this hopefully is going to give us a much nicer result because we're going to have like thousands and thousands of verts. Obviously that's much more expensive, um, but you're going to get a better result to it. Um, PN triangle is a very similar thing. Basically what it tries to do is it tries to smooth that result as it's uh, as it's dividing. So if it's a, a plane like we've got here on the ground, I'd probably use flat triangles. Um, for something that was like a more rounded shape, like a character, you probably want to use PN triangles, but um, that's sort of the difference between those two. So, um, so I've set it here, turned on flat tessellation. Um, we'll get onto these other settings in a minute. Um, and then just plugged in the world displacement and a tessellation multiplier. So just apply that. And if we jump over to the wireframe, in a second. So here, with it selected, you can see the default that 10 by 10 grid again but with it off you can see hopefully that's a really high resolution uh, mesh there's now uh, thousands or hundreds of, of verts per quad um, and as we pull away from that not much happening now if I set the tessellation multiplier down to 1 you can see the the amount of, of tessellation is being controlled by the distance to the camera um, so that way it's, it's adding the extra detail where you need it making it more expensive um, but not of like ruining your performance by having this extra tessellation detail everywhere and this multiplier is changing how that kind of that ratio is happening um, so low values and then high values and it is capped at a certain amount there's a it's not going to increase the tessellation above this if you wanted more tessellation than this you'd need to start with a higher res mesh in the first place so there's a there's a limit um, to how much this can do so we jump back to the lip view um, Setup is exactly the same, so it's the height map multiplied by an amount. Um, I just bump that up a little bit more, get a better result, or a more visible result. Um, and multiplied, in this case, I've talked about by the vertex normals, so we'll have a look at why in a minute. But for this case, the, the vertex normals of the plane are all pointing up. So, in fact, the, the difference here between the vertex normals and the up direction, there isn't any. Um, but if I rotate this plane, you'll see you're getting your tessellation is now relative to the plane so it's out from the vertex normals whereas with this one if I jump back to the world position if I rotate it the movement's happening vertically and you can see on on that top edge so uh, it's worth thinking about how you're going to use these whether you need to be using vertex normals or a, a world space direction um, for your tessellation um, and you can see you get a better result you get because of that extra sort of artificial geometry, obviously if you push it too far, there is a limit. There's also going to be some compression in our normal map or in our height map. Sorry, um, obviously that doesn't look very good. But for smaller numbers, 10, 15, you can get a bit of an artificial sort of 3D bumpiness to your shader, um, which works quite well. Um, the other options we have down here were crack free displacement. Um, now I've not managed to get this to work too well. Um, the idea is that here when we're using the vertex normals, whenever we've got a hard edge in our geometry, there is a, um, a split. So if I just do this and then check on a model. Say this rock. So our tessellation is happening and we see we're getting a, uh, this is where the UV seam is in our shader or in our, our model, sorry um, and so the tessellation's creating a hole there because there's a hard edge where the UV seam is um, and then as that's pushing outwards if I up that amount it's going to be separating those verts out now crack free displacement should when I say should um, fix that, or at least help to try and fix that and maybe in this case because it's a rounded shape we might want PN triangles um, but unfortunately, I was not able to get this to work. So, well, it's done a, an okay job. But depending on the amount of tessellation you have, uh, maybe it has done a, a decent job on this one. Um, as you push that out, so now you're seeing where the UV seams are, you're not getting any crack. Obviously, this is a bit more calculations, a bit more expensive, so only use it where you have to. Um, I might turn that crack free displacement back off again. We should now be able to see see daylight through our mesh now, where the, uh, the holes in the UV seams are. So, um, yeah, there you are. So that's what crack-free displacement is going to do for us, um, and that's the difference between PN triangles, giving us a slightly more curved 
Maybe this was what I tried earlier. Just go back and just check this out. Mm, no, it's working. Not sure what I was doing wrong earlier, but that seems to be working now, so um, that's good. Um, and that's what's giving us our displacement. Um, obviously, that's far too high a number. Drop that down to 20. Um, cool. Um, moving on. We could also do, well, I should say, so everything here is happening per vertex. Obviously, the more vertices you have, the better the result you're getting, whether that's well position offset or with your dynamically tessellation, tessellating. Um, but it's still not quite being per per pixel. Um, so there's something else we could try in the shader, and that's uh, first we're going to try bump mapping. So in this case, we're back to using the, the super flat plane, very little geometry. Um, and what bump mapping is doing is just using the height map um, information and what it's doing is it's effectively trying to um, calculate where the, the the projection of where those UVs should be going so um, effectively it's it's creating if I just push the height up a lot it's creating kind of like the illusion of the surface being at different heights um, if I just unplug this uh -uh, I'm just plug in a constant in there for now see if I can demo this a little better. So here we're just comparing, we're using a constant height map and we're using a bump of set height to do that. So as you can change those values, you see it's it's kind of like artificially pushing the the surface up or down. That's relative to a height reference plane that lives inside the bump of set nose. Um, and so really useful for lots of uh, for VFX techniques. You can get some things moving. Um, but you do get some swimming potentially I push this up quite high, you can see we're getting some weird movement and things happening there. So it's a very subtle effect, but if we plug in a height map rather than a specific height, as we had before, it's just going to kind of like move the pixels that should be a little bit higher in the height map just up a bit so that you get this kind of illusion of, um, of depth. Obviously, if it goes too high, you start getting some really bad swimming. Um, Yeah, so it's like I say, it's quite a subtle effect. It definitely can't be pushed too far, um, otherwise it's going to start breaking. But to add a little bit of depth to this, to your materials, you can totally do this. Um, notice it will break. Obviously, any horizontal the closer you get to the sort of the shallow angles, um, tessellation actually has moved the vertices. So if we get quite low down to it, you can see we're still getting that bumpiness. Um, maybe not the best result. The height map. This isn't from a baked height map. A, height, a baked height map would have given you a better result. Um, this has just been calculated in in sort of software. Um, but yeah, bump offset gives you some kind of additional sort of parallax to those pixels. Um, but you do get this sort of stretching potentially um, and some swimming. So bump offset, another way of doing it. Um, you can push that a little bit further. So we have what's called here is parallax occlusion mapping, or POM. Um, if I open the material for this, this is using uh, an inbuilt function, the parallax occlusion mapping function. Um, there's some good examples of this in the content examples if you want to know some more about it. Um, but basically, it's doing the very similar kind of thing to the bump offset, but it's doing it multiple times. So you end up with multiple slices, um, and each of those slices is then sort of offset by the pixels in the height map. So what you end up with is, is not getting that swimming. Um, and you get a nicer result. Sometimes if you can zoom in you can kind of see where those slices are. So they see a little bit of swimming there, but it's much closer you have to get before the illusion sort of gets broken. So um and there's obviously settings for, for how many steps, how many slices you're doing. If I just really crank those up and zoom in, you can now be able to see that swimming is a lot better depending on how close you want to get to this. Obviously if the camera's getting this close, maybe we want to actually model some geometry in here. Um but for Sort of a third person character game where you're standing here about this high off the surface. It's, it's quite nice. It's quite good, good result for this. Again, depending on how much you try and push this, you're going to get some really bad swimming. Um, 8, 8, 0.04. But for little subtle details, um, you can get some quite nice results. Um, and then finally, there's nothing stopping you combining these results together except possibly performance. Um, so here I've got some tessellation turned on. I'm using tessellation for uh, a sort of a surface displacement. I'm also using the well position offset. 
So I'm moving the vertices of the plane sort of to get a kind of overall shape um, as well as the sort of interior shape. And then I've also put some POM uh, or collusion mapping on the pixels as well. So um, most expensive, all three sort of techniques combined. Um, but if you're doing a cinematic or making a movie, something that isn't gameplay, um, maybe this is, is an acceptable thing. And you compare it to the, sort of the original, it looks quite... Ooh, looks quite flat and boring. If I could zoom in, there we go. Um, not a lot going on. And then we go all the way over to our combined mesh here. We're getting much more sort of surface, nice detail. And it is trying to be performant for you. So obviously as you scale away from it, that's going to reduce all that sort of cost down because you're going to have less vertices being pushed through the, through the displacement. Um, and you can set up things with the POM as well to have kind of like a distance a component to it um, if you so if you need to for performance reasons so um, yeah a few different ways of doing these things um, try them out have a look do some research of your own see how how the performance impacts your scene what kind of nice results you can get um, it's definitely um, as modern hardware is getting better, it's definitely going to be something that we're going to start trying to use more and more, hopefully. Um, sort of new console generations, etc., coming out. Um, but if not, you can always try it on your own portfolio work. Or, like I say, if you're doing cutscenes or movies or something like that, and you really want to kind of crank up that, that quality, having these, these kind of techniques in your tool bag um, can be really nice. So, hopefully, that helps. Hopefully, it's been. Uh, informative as always questions comments etc let me know um big thank you to everyone who is uh, following me on patreon and supporting these um and yeah and i will see you all next time